Um, so, okay, this hand is gonna be a pretty clear open in this spot. We're just gonna go with the same 3X sizing. Ideally, at 100 big blinds, I would like to be able to open to 2.5X, but obviously, we're not playing with any chips smaller than five, so we're just gonna make it 3X. Suited calls off holds. All right, so this offsuit Broadway is probably too weak to defend to an end in the gun range from the small line, but I think in the big blind with nobody left to act and with these relatively small sizes, uh, as well as an inflated small blind that's dead, um, we can make the call with this hand. I think even if you open just a little bit bigger, I'd consider folding it, but here I'm gonna be calling. So we're going to be focusing exclusively on post-flop strategy, but since post-flop is heavily dependent on the pre-flop ranges, there are a couple of things we will note here. First is that as Matt Hunt mentioned, he and everyone else is opening to 3x, whereas if you play online, you are more likely to see smaller opens such as 2.5x or even 2x. This should cause the ranges to be slightly tighter compared to smaller opens. However, this effect is somewhat mitigated by the fact that the small blind is the same size as the big blind, which means there's more money in the middle to win, which should cause the players to play slightly wider. And finally, there is no rake, which means that there shouldn't be as strong of an incentive to try to take the pot down preflop, resulting in more cold calling compared to a raked environment. With all that being said, both Matt Hunt's open and Matt Vaughn's defend are both fine according to this custom sim we've run. So real quick, there are some textures where I will have a leading range from out of position as the preflop caller, but there are more so going to be boards where I have a pretty strong range advantage, where I have also a nut advantage, and this just isn't one of them. Hunt can have every set. I can probably only have pocket eights. Uh, we both probably have reasonably equal two pair combos, and he's going to have more uh, over pairs and obviously ace king. So I'm going to be checking here super high frequency and this hand will be included in that. So Vaughn checks here, but before doing so, he analyzes the situation. Many people auto decide seemingly routine spots such as this one, but glossing over nodes in that way can cause you to miss some EV, and also it makes range construction in ladder nodes more difficult. So we are going to slow down and analyze this spot through the lens of the GTO check system, which always begins with the macro analysis. First of all, Vaughn's out of position and they're relatively deep stacked. This should make him more inclined to play passively. It's easier to realize equity in position, and this advantage is elevated when there are more chips behind to play for. Also, even if the out of position player has a strong hand, it's still very possible for the in position player to put in a bet on the same street, which gives the out of position player the opportunity to check raise. From a range morphology standpoint, if we had to categorize Hunt's range, it would likely be balanced. He has all the nutted hands, kings, jacks, eights, king jack, king eight, aces, ace king. He also should have many middling hands, like under pairs. And he has many weak hands as well, particularly ace highs. Vaughn's range in the big blind, on the other hand, is probably more bottom heavy. He should have three bet hands like aces, kings, jacks, and king jack suited, so he's at a distinct nut disadvantage. And he also has a decent amount of trash, with many more suited connectors in his range relative to hunt. So considering all of these macro factors, Vaughn checking his entire range makes sense, and we can end our analysis here even without looking at his cards. So this is obviously a pretty good flop for our hand. It's also a pretty good flop for our range as well in this spot, Logic against Big Blind. However, this is a situation where even though I probably have a pretty solid equity advantage here against the Big Blind, I don't have much of a nut advantage. Matt can possibly have jacks in his range with some frequency. He can also have King Jack, Jack 8, and King 8 suited. Um, so there's a decent combo number of combos of two pair in his range. It's not going to be super easy for me to just bet really large here. So I think sizing wise, I'm going to go small and I think I'm going to go relatively high frequency. So we're just going to go with a small bet of 10 and continue from there. So although Matt Hunt recognizes that he has an advantage here, he discounts it to a certain degree. This appears to indicate that he believes Vaughn has more of a balanced range. 
And this is a good example of why utilizing ranged morphologies can be helpful to retain your focus on the big picture. In almost every scenario, it will be possible to think of certain very strong hands or very weak hands or medium hands in the opponent's range. The risk when doing this is that you become focused on one region without considering the others and it can skew how you perceive the strength of your opponent. But when you go through the exercise of categorizing the range as a whole, it forces you to consider each of the prominent regions of that range. So in this case, yes, it is possible that Vaughn has jacks or eights or king jack, king eight or jack eight, but relatively speaking, this is a small proportion of his range. In contrast, he has a bunch of ace x suited and queen x suited combos, as well as lower suited connectors that have very low equity with no flush draw available. But in any event, regardless of whether Vaughn's range is more appropriately categorized as bottom heavy or balanced, both of these range shapes include a significant amount of trash, which will almost always warrant a small bet. There are plenty of mediocre and some weak hands in Matt Hunt's range that will benefit from taking down the pot now, so from an EV perspective, betting small has a good likelihood of causing much of Matt Vaughn's range to fold. So we see that the solver uses this small bet 60% of the time, and the EV regret for all combos betting this amount is only 0.2% of the pot. So even though Hunt's specific hand is very strong, to simplify things you could, similar to the big blind, just make your decision at the macro level without diving into the details. Okay, so pot's 35 and Matt goes for a down bet of $10. This board is coordinated, but um, it doesn't have a flusher on it, so the size seems pretty reasonable. I think that there are some one pair hands I guess I could check raise for value, but I think that given that it's versus under the gun, I shouldn't be doing that too often. I'd rather do that against uh, ranges that will contain more weaker King X, like if I was up against the button. Potentially I could still check raise Ace King if I don't three bet a pre King Queen. Um, but this one I think is just going to function much better as a call. Obviously with my exact kicker, I can also um, pick up equity on some turns. And obviously top pairs can be good here a pretty significant majority of the time. But that doesn't mean I'm necessarily um, going broke in this spot. But especially against a small size, very easy call. So Vaughn starts his analysis by considering the range matchup, correctly identifying the fact that the under the gun range is going to be much stronger than the button range, so his level of check raising should be limited. He then recognizes that his hand is relatively high up his distribution in this spot as he discusses the possibility of raising with top pair. And finally, he shifts to the micro analysis, deciding that he would likely need a stronger kicker, an ace or a queen, to raise given these positions. And as we can see, the solver agrees that kicker is impacting raising frequency with this class. Although sets and two pairs mostly raise, a bare top pair is more prone to be dominated by the under the gun's stronger range. King 10 suited with the backdoor flush draw is more inclined to raise, but King 10 off is pretty much just a pure defend. So nothing really changes here again, leading for me on turn cards is going to be highly dependent on picking up a lot of equity or not advantage as my whole range rather than uh, a specific holding and even for the specific holding this card doesn't really change anything so I'm going to be checking the range here. The turn is the three of spades and again notice how Matt considers his options instead of just auto checking. He notes that on certain turn cards he could lead, but this is not one of them. Generally, there are two things which can cause a player's range to change its morphology. One, player actions, or two, a new board card. So when a new board card is uncovered, but it is a blank, which doesn't heavily interact with either player's ranges, the range morphologies that existed at the end of the immediately prior street are carried over to the new street. Given that Matt Hunt bent small, most of his range likely remains intact as being balanced, and given Vaughn's call and failure to raise, his range likely becomes more mid-heavy. If we go back to Vaughn's flop defense, we see that most of his strongest hands raise and most of his trash folds, so what we're left over with when he calls is predominantly the middle part of the range. If we filter the big blinds range for hands that check and increase the checking frequency threshold, we see that the range becomes more and more mid-heavy. And as we know, a mid-heavy range tends to play passively, particularly out of position, so checking range here makes sense given that the turn card is not dynamic. So this card is naturally a complete brick on this board. 
And generally speaking, in a spot like this, I'm gonna to wanna to go with a large bet sizing with a very polarized range. So here, when Matt's fairly capped, he also has a lot of draws. I think that a size that puts a lot of pressure on his one pair of hands and folds out all of those draws is gonna be really beneficial. So I think we're probably gonna to have to go something like 80 here. I think 80 is gonna be good, so let's go with that. So Hunt skillfully recognizes the situation with the blank turn and the relative range shapes of the players. Although Vaughn's range on the flop was likely bottom heavy, given his passive call of the small bet, it is now quite clearly mid heavy. Anytime an uncapped range, whether it be polarized or balanced, encounters a mid heavy range, a large sizing will almost always be used, at least at some frequency. And this makes sense when we consider the spot from an EV perspective. There's not a lot of EV to be derived from making a smaller bet versus a mid-heavy range. If we have a weak hand or a mediocre hand, a small bet doesn't accomplish much because a mid-heavy range has, relatively speaking, limited amounts of trash that will auto-fold. Accordingly, we see the small third pot bet being used less than 2% of the time. To maximize our fold equity versus a mid-heavy range consisting of decent equity hands, we generally will need to use larger sizings which leverages our significant nut advantage. Additionally, our strongest hands also have an incentive to bet large because a mid-heavy range is full of bluff catchers that can defend big sizings. However, our middle strength hands don't really like to bet large because it becomes more unlikely that we will be called by worse. So now that we've established from a macro perspective, that we should want to play a polarized strategy, the next step is to move on to the mesoanalysis to determine how we should allocate our hand based on its strength. Matt Hunt's specific hand, pocket eights, is very high up his equity distribution, so it's clearly a nuttish hand. When our range overall wants to polarize, hands in the nudge class will almost always be allocated to the betting bucket, particularly when we are in position. Out of position, there may be a few traps thrown in, but generally you cannot go wrong with hammering your strongest hands when the range is polarizing. And we see this phenomenon reflected in this sim, where all sets, two pairs and over pairs, are virtually all betting, and the maximum EV loss for the combos in this bracket over betting 145% is less than 0.2% of the pot. So we can stop our deliberation at the meso analysis and simply bet all of our pocket eights without considering blockers or suits or any other micro attributes. Okay, so this is pretty interesting. Hunt goes for a turn over bet. There's 55 in the pot and the bet is 80. Um, I think that this is probably pretty good with whatever hands he's choosing to do it with. He has a lot of hands in range that want to deny my equity now. He can also pressure a lot of the medium strength holdings in my range uh, with bluffs because he bets so small and flop, he allows my range to continue pretty wide here to the turn. I would expect him to do this with a lot of hands that are strong draws and combo draws, uh, very strong top pairs like ace-king, king-queen, sets, two pairs. It doesn't really eliminate him from having too many holdings, except for, I, I'm not so sure he's gonna do this with uh, a lot of weaker draws, which makes my exact hand uh, kind of uncomfortable because it's going to struggle to continue against basically more action that is like this and obviously if we call here the pot now inflates pretty rapidly to being over two hundred dollars and we're looking at potentially uh, an overbet all in on the river uh, i actually don't know if we have a spade in hand that's somewhat relevant here i do have the king of spades which i guess is good given that the king of spades obviously is on the board we have it but it's not on the board which means theoretically he could hold it I'm actually not positive if he would be more likely to overbet with a hand like that or choose a smaller size because he actually blocks many of the stronger top pair and strong like backdoor draws that I could hold. So he might be less inclined to overbet with that hand anyway. So it might not be that relevant. I think all in all, even though we do block some of the draws with our 10, not having the 10 of spades is probably better. Um, having the king of spades rather than the 10 of spades is probably good. So. I'm definitely not folding yet, but I'm unsure on rivers what we're going to be doing. I imagine that having the 10 is going to be pretty bad on a lot of brick rivers. If we do face an all in, we will block some of the strong straight draws, but again, not having it be the 10 of spades is good. So I might just kind of have to see what the exact river is and try to figure it out then. I'm definitely not sure right now. 
Given Hunt's overbet, we see his range to immediately start to polarize, with the top and bottom of his range presenting most prominently. And when one player polarizes, it tends to force the opponent's range to become more condensed unless he responds with a raise. Given that the bottom end of Hunt's value betting range is top pair, Vaughn's top pairs are likely pure value catchers, so defending all top pairs is a reasonable play in this spot. If you wanted to refine your analysis here a bit, you could differentiate the top pairs based on kicker, given that it is much less likely that Hunt would have overbet with top pair weak kicker, but even then, from a micro standpoint, holding a king is valuable because you are blocking a significant portion of Hunt's value range. The river is another brick, the four hearts, and as discussed, when a new board card does not significantly interact with either player's ranges, the range morphologies in place at the end of the prior street remain intact in the current street. As we know, when Hunt overbet the turn, it polarized his range, and when Vaughn called that overbet, it condensed his range even further. If he had any sets or two pairs left over, some of those should have raised, particularly with a flush draw on the board and many of his weakest hands that called the small flop bet should have folded. So we have a very mid-heavy range matched up with a very polarized range, and so Vaughn can just check range without any further considerations. So that card is a complete brick as well. Um, I want to recheck my whole cards just to make sure I don't mess anything up here. So that card's a complete brick, which puts us in a position that's it's actually it's a really good spot for us because when a brick rolls off like that, basically everything that overbet the turn can then continue overbetting the river because nothing in his range got stronger and everything in my range either got much stronger or much weaker. Meaning that even though I have about two X pot behind, maybe a little bit less than that, uh, this is still gonna work pretty well for uh, just an all in shove as my only bet sizing. There's no reason to ever use anything less here. And particularly with the hand I have, I have the advantage of being able to actually block some of his weaker bluff catches, so block some of his Atex of spades and unblock a lot of his King X that is gonna be in a tough spot and may consider bluff catching. So uh, we're just gonna be all in and see what happens. All in. So Hunt does a really good job here of articulating the dynamic with the Brick to River card, saying that basically anything that bet on the turn can continue on the river, capturing the general dynamic of how a polarized range tends to operate, with aggression. What goes unsaid, but I think is implied by his use of the word basically, is that in theory there should be a small portion of his range that bet on the turn that checks back on the river and or depolarizes with a smaller bet. With Vaughn calling the overbet on the turn, although his range is capped, the bottom half of his range was strengthened because so many weaker hands should have folded. So Hunt's threshold for which hands are allocated to the betting bucket needs to be elevated on the river. As we can see, the solver actually isn't shoving top pairs or over pairs because at least according to this sim, the big blind does have some superior hands such as king three, king four, and some other slow played two pairs and sets. Some of Hunt's bluffs should also give up on the river as well, particularly flush draws and ace highs. That being said, from a meso analysis perspective, Hunt's specific hand, pocket eights, is certainly strong enough to shove. Although a small portion of his range is depolarizing with a non-shove bet to allow some strong but not totally nutted hands to capture a bit more EV, if Hunt wanted to use a shove or check strategy, which would be reasonable given his polarized range, shoving all two pairs and sets in position loses very limited EV. Okay, so as mentioned, not shocked to see this size. Um, there was 55 in the pond turn. Uh, we put in 160, so there's 215 in the pot on the river, and he's jamming for uh, basically almost exactly 2x pot. What did you, he's, he says he's not a math guy. Um, so I was starting to think about what I would do if there was a spade on the river, given that I have the king of spades, and I, I think you know, I'm kind of in the same boat because he's not usually going to pick a hand to have a smaller size here and I get to like check raise or anything cute like that. It's still just going to be facing an all in. But given that the spades missed, I think this is pretty good for me. Um, I do, again, still block straight draws, but I don't block 
any flush draws that I was thinking he would take this line with. Obviously, I'm blocking some of the value like ace, king, kings. And when the spades miss, and I think that a big portion of his bluffing range on turn includes spades, it's pretty hard to want to give up here. I'm also trying to think about what my range looks like in this spot and how many strong hands I actually arrive at the river with. And there's just not really so many. Um, I think that I'm pretty incentivized to put in some check raises on flop with a lot of my two pair combos. I never improved to two pair on turn or river. Probably never improved to sets either. I probably just muck threes on the flop. And so when I'm looking at the best holdings I can have, I can have some slow plays of two pairs, some slow plays of sets. But besides that, king, queen, and a probably pretty low to negligible frequency of ace, king, I'm actually starting to be kind of close to the top of my range here. It's probably a spot where I don't even arrive at the river with a lot of worse kings, so maybe I'm closer to the bottom than I think. But I do also have a lot of draws here that we'll have to release. Some of those will get it in on the turn, but some won't versus an overbet. So I'm kind of just leaning toward call. Uh, we're also in a format that moves a little bit slow and I think kind of incentivizes people to just go for it. And even though I think Hunt is about as level as they come, he's still going to be kind of influenced by that. I think his line makes perfect sense. There's nothing uh, magical going on here in terms of me deciding the call, but I do think call probably makes sense, although I'm sort of on the exact combo that I'm unsure about, which is always fun when you're facing 2x pot. But I am uh, I am going to call. Stop. Shows. Sorry. So with Hunt shoving, it polarizes his range even further, and as we've established, Vaughn's range is very condensed or mid-heavy. Although Vaughn appears to talk himself into a call because he's near the top of his range, this factor becomes less relevant in a polarized versus mid-heavy matchup. It's more important when Villain bets smaller and has a more balanced range consisting of a greater number of medium strength hands, but when virtually all of Villain's value is far ahead of the top of your range, bluff catching comes down to blockers. And when we're in the microanalysis, we need to refine our morphologies and get into the details by constructing individual combinations. Specifically, in a bluff catching scenario, we want to identify the most likely value combos and bluffs in villain's range. So in this case, as we discussed, Hunt's most likely value combos will be kings, jacks, eights, king jack, and king eight. These are the hands we want to block. So we can narrow our best bluff catchers to king x and jack x. So what about Hunt's bluffs? Well, as Vaughn correctly identified, the most prominent weak hand in Hunt's range by the river are missed spade draws. However, from a theory perspective, Hunt should have been less inclined to triple barrel with spades because those spades would block Vaughn's missed flush draws, which would be autofolds. Accordingly, we see that the solver is actually more inclined to call with a spade since spades unblock villain's bluffs from a theory perspective. Of course, in reality, if your opponent only has busted spade draws or doesn't know anything about card removal, then holding a spade may actually be a bad card to bluff catch with from an exploitative perspective. So if the solver is not bluffing with its spades, where are most of its bluffs coming from? Well, they're more likely to come from missed straight draws, which also block some of Vaughn's autofolds, but not as many as his missed spades. So Queen-10 and 10-9 in particular are likely prominent bluffing candidates from Hunt's perspective because they had the open ender. Given this, we see that a 10 in particular is probably the worst card to hold from a bluff catching standpoint. So although holding a king is good, Given the amount of King X Vaughn has in his range and the size of the bet, not all King X can call, and one of his first folds in this class should be King 10, since the 10 makes it much less likely that Hunt is bluffing. Vaughn's better bluff catching candidates would include King X with lower kickers or that contain a spade, or Jack X combos with a spade that block value and unblock bluffs.